Well, good morning. It's uh, 10 o'clock and we'll give people another minute or two and then get uh, started. All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. It's a minute or so after 10 o'clock. I uh, just wanna thank you all for joining us today on our, for our March uh, webinar on fund mapping, the why and how of fiduciary action. I uh, just wanna let everybody know this is being recorded. Uh, we'll be sending out a link uh, to the recording after, after the presentation. And we will be monitoring uh, for any questions uh, in the chat feature. So if you have those, feel free to, uh, to add them there. We'll attempt to answer them either during the webinar or we'll get back to you afterwards. We'll go ahead and move on to the next uh, slide. Uh, my name is David Williams. I am a senior consultant and a, the director of our investment services uh, and chair our investment committee at Multnomah Group. And I'm joined today uh, by my colleague, Haley McLaughlin. Hi, yes, despite the Zoom settings, um, I am Haley McLaughlin. I'm a consultant here out of our Portland office. I'm also the director of vendor services and chair our vendor services committee responsible for the oversight um, and due diligence on our record keeping partners. Thanks, Haley. Um, so as we move to the next slide, and one of the important responsibilities that fiduciaries have is to provide investment oversight. And as a result of that oversight, it's likely that from time to time there will be required changes to the investment menu. Um, while committees always have uh, fund selection uh, discretion with regard to the investment options, um, fund mapping presents a special circumstances circumstance and requires uh, careful consideration of the options. Um, what we have here on this slide are you know five common reasons for fund mapping. Um, some are obvious, some might not be quite as obvious in your day-to-day -day responsibilities as a committee member. Um, the first one here, replacing a fund, um, this is probably the most common uh, reason uh, for, for fund mapping and largely this comes as a result of a maybe lost confidence in a manager, maybe a portfolio manager has is, is changed uh, and therefore the strategy may be different than what you originally selected. Or you may see some performance difference uh, relative to benchmark and therefore there's a recommendation for change. Um, the second option there, removing an asset class uh, I think this is pretty, uh, pretty self-explanatory, but uh, kind of coincides maybe with the third option of investment menu redesign. Every once in a while, committees will take a step back and look at their investment menu uh, in kind of that 30,000 foot level. And as a result of that uh, discussion, there may be the desire to simplify the investment lineup, or you may get a request from a participant to add an asset class that you're not offering today, or there may be low utilization of certain asset classes, and you may ultimately decide to consolidate the investment lineup or the investment menu. Record keeper change. Um, you know, the re if you were to go through a record keeper search and you end up moving from record keeper A to record keeper B, um, it's possible uh, that you may move from a proprietary fund lineup to more of an open architecture structure at your new record keeper. And therefore you have an opportunity to revamp the investment options and there may, be, may need to be 
uh, some changes in the, the funds and therefore some fund mapping. And then finally, uh, re-enrollment. This is an opportunity to re-engage participants and employees about the retirement plan choices. We'll talk a little bit more about this, but this presents a, somewhat of a unique opportunity uh, to reset participants' engagement with, uh, with the retirement plan. So now that we've talked about the, the why you would need to do uh, fund mapping, let's talk about some of the, the hows or the, the reasons or the methods for, for fund mapping. Um, these are three common types of, of uh, fund mappings. Um, we do see them sometimes used in combination with one another uh, at, uh, by committees, depending on the amount of change that they're, they're undertaking. But really, let's start with the, the first one, which is, is probably the most common uh, fund mapping exercise or method that we see used by participants and that, or by plan sponsors, and that's the like fund mapping. So mapping from fund A to fund B, and those funds uh, are ultimately, the removed fund is substantially similar to the new fund um, that's uh, in, in the plan. And there's kind of look at it from a qualitative and quantitative perspective. On the qualitative side, you know, the old fund um, may have the same management strategy as the new fund. So maybe an active fund to an active fund or a passive fund to a passive fund. Um, it may be in the same category. So you're maintaining a large cap value fund. You just are removing that large cap value fund and replacing it with another large cap value fund. On a quantitative basis, we wanna look at some statistics and make sure that the funds have similar risk and return profiles or volatility profiles so that we're not moving maybe participants from a low volatility fund to a high volatility fund. And that's gonna substantially change kind of that risk profile of the fund. We're trying to make sure that we're mapping to like, uh, like options and ultimately looking for funds to be very correlated to one another so that they move at similar, uh, they move in similar patterns over, over time. The benefits of this like fund mapping approach is that it really honors participants' elections. So at some point, a participant has decided to be in a particular fund category. You've decided as a committee that that fund is no longer appropriate for the plan and you're replacing with a new option, but you're replacing with an option that still honors that participant's decision to be in, for example, large cap value. You're just replacing it with a manager in large cap value that you have greater confidence in going forward. Haley, um, you know, maybe an experience or two that you've had with clients on your, in their thought process in using uh, option one. Yeah, definitely. So I, I completely agree. This is by the numbers, the most common kind of fund mapping that we do. Um, and so if you'll allow me, I have two stories. And I think one is a more traditional single fund to single fund. And then one um, is a change in record keepers and how we, we thought through that. So, you know, every so often, um, our investment committee will recommend for removal of fund in some of our clients' portfolios. And so we go to that client with the recommendation to remove a specific investment manager for you know, reasons. And those depend and are as varied as the managers themselves. Um, and we also often come with one or two or more um, recommendations for replacements. And so those tend to be, um, you know, specific asset class to specific asset class. So we're removing a large growth fund and we are replacing it with a large growth fund. They're in the same peer group. They have similar asset class exposures. They have similar investment styles. So um, over the, the first quarter, we had a fair, a fair number of these. Um, the committee accepted our recommendation for the removal of the current fund and the replacement for the new fund. We sent out, um, the required legal notices, but beyond that, it's not a huge impact on participants because we are honoring their elections. It's not changing their asset um, allocation. And so it's fairly low impact and a really easy um, transition to explain um, and for participants to understand. I mean, that's something we do pretty, pretty often. 
Um, the other time you can do like fund mapping is um, on a larger scale. So um, recently a client that had worked with us for a couple of years decided to do a request for proposal um, and through that process selected a new record keeper which is great. And so we, we started working through how we were going to get the assets from pool um, record keeper one to record keeper two. And they had been a client with us for a couple of years. So the investment menu at their current record keeper was in good health. We, we felt good about it. We didn't um, expect to make any changes, but with the platform change, there was an opportunity to switch um, invest, um, index providers to be a lower cost. And because of some platform limitations, we needed to switch um, the providers for the ESG funds. So there were half a dozen changes um, that were going to be made as part of this broader transition from Record Keeper 1 to Record Keeper 2. And so by and large, the bulk of the assets um, moved in kind, right? They, we just re-registered the funds. So you are in investment A at Record Keeper 1. You are still in investment A at Record Keeper 2. No changes. In this case, you didn't even get out of the market during the change. We literally just reassigned the shares of the investment manager and the investment product. Um, but for those half dozen that we were changing, we did a direct like to like mapping during the transition. So um, in the uh, total stock market index um, went from this uh, record keeper to this record keeper. They're nearly identical. It was really an opportunity to lower costs. They're tracking the same benchmark, a very easy transition. Um, this also continues to honor participant elections and was we were able to do it because we could very easily select um, similar products. Um, if there had been a lot of investment products in the original record keeper that we weren't going to maintain, then we would have to have another discussion about um, further options that we'll get into a little bit later. But um, for ease of communication for participants, um, the like to like mapping made the most sense in this case. So I think, you know, if we look at option two um, of the three, this is not a, exactly a like to like, it's sort of a, the next step um, um, along the spectrum of options, but it's mapping to a broadly diversified asset class option. We see this most often when you are simplifying a menu or removing an asset class. So um, you do this when the plan doesn't offer an obvious um, replacement mapping option and the committee is seeking to simplify the investment menu, maybe eliminate a high risk asset class um, or reduce asset class overlap. So, you know, for example, you have um, an inflation adjusted bond product in the menu. We decide that we no longer want um, that asset class in the menu because we wanna simplify uh, choices for participants. And so we map all of those assets and elections to maybe a total bond index. A couple of pros to this, it, it continues to honor participants' um, elections and asset class um, allocation um, because we are, it is a similar asset class while not an exact um, like to like fund. Um, it also can result in lower investment costs um, because we're often using um, index funds as the broadly diversified asset class option and those tend to be, to be less expensive. So David, do you have um, a story of a time that you opted to do this mapping option and maybe why the committee chose to go that way? Yeah, we, you know, as I mentioned, um, we this last quarter spent a lot of time with clients on their investment menus. And so some of the discussions that we've had with those clients have focused on kind of the rationalization of the number and uh, number of options that they're offering to kind of better align with some of the behavioral finance research that suggests participants are more comfortable uh, and engaged with the plan if they have a more, I guess, defined set of options to choose from. And so one example here was a, a client looking at their options and, you know, they currently had an emerging market fund that had, you know, half a percent of total assets. So it was, you know, not utilized by a broad uh, swath of their participant base. And ultimately what they decided is that Emerging markets are a piece of the pie of a total international stock market index that includes, you know, large, mid, small, developed, uh, and emerging. So it was a component of that total stock market index, and they decided to consolidate the fund lineup by removing the emerging market fund and and um, 
mapping it into a total international stock market index uh, option. So that was that was uh, one one example of a you know, moving from a niche asset class to a more broadly uh, broadly uh, exposed asset asset uh, class. David, do you think we're seeing this more often as as plans are are looking to streamline their investment menu? I mean, if you think about a decade ago, I think plans had a lot more options then. Yeah, well, not to age myself, but I could go two decades ago. <laughs> and, and really, when I look back to my the early part of my career and, and working in a record keeping firm, what I remember then was 60 and 70 options uh, and you know plans that had at most 5 million in total. I mean, so it was a small, small plan solution and it was more of a, let's offer the world to people. This is back in the, you know, the late nineties with the tech sector rally and you know, everybody needed a sector, sector focused fund. So there was this proliferation of options and the behavioral finance is really focused uh, clients and from a fiduciary risk and a communication side uh, towards people are more comfortable with fewer options that are truly diversified, but they're more willing to make a, a, a decision from a narrow menu rather than a, you know, the buffet style approach. Definitely. The third and final uh, kind of common method of, of fund mapping that we see is we'll call it QDIA mapping. And, uh, QDIA stands for Qualified Default Investment Alternative. It's an acronym that came out of the, uh, the PPA, the 2006 Pension Protection Act uh, that provided some guidance to employers uh, with regards to investment fund selection, you know, prior to, you know, a little history lesson, prior to, you know, Pension Protection Act, the most common default option was a money market or stable value fund in a 401k or 403b plan. Well, most people knew that that probably wasn't the right answer for participants on a long-term basis from an earnings power and keeping up with inflation uh, standpoint. Uh, there was concern around the fiduciary risk uh, for committees for that selection. You know, everybody was afraid if somebody loses money, then they'll get they'll get sued. Well, the you know, QDIA and PPA provided some of that fiduciary relief as long as you follow a prudent process and there's disclosure notices that go out to participants. So, with that as as background, um, this third option has kind of picked up steam over the last number of years um, for a couple of reasons. One is sometimes you don't have an obvious option for mapping like, like, in, like in option one, you're not moving from a large gap value to another large gap value fund or an option two, you're, you're not moving from you know, a fund that's a component of a larger index option. Um, so if you don't have those obvious mapping uh, solutions, or you're considering something like re-enrollment, or you're just doing a lot of changes all at once, there's, a, there's an opportunity for QDIA mapping. So here what you're doing is you're, you're deciding to take all the funds that are being removed and mapping them to the age-appropriate uh, target date fund, which age-appropriate target date fund is one of a number of QDIA options, which just happens to be the most prevalent option within the within the marketplace. Um, and the reason why, again, this is so desirable is because you're mapping people into a diversified investment option that is going to de-risk or become less uh, less volatile. Is the is the plan as time goes on as participants near near retirement. So the benefits here are one, it's a risk reducer for committees uh, because of that uh, safe harbor protection from, uh, from the, the regulations. Uh, and particularly when you have funds that don't have good mapping options or good correlations with other funds that are in your plan. And two, and this is a bit more of a paternalistic view is that um, participants may be un, un unbalanced, uh, maybe out of balance with regard to some uh, an asset allocation that's appropriate for their specific circumstances. Um, as time goes on, if the equity markets are always going up and the bond markets are flat, then 
you know, somebody's 60, 40 allocation and give them some 70, 30, and they have more risk in their portfolio than they may have intended. And ultimately, the QDIA is multi-asset class and so does uh, provide some, some, uh, some good diversification for participants uh, in, in, uh, in their investment allocation. Haley, maybe a, a thought or two from some clients that have explored this option. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, we are seeing this more and more often as we are doing larger scale changes to investment menus, whether that's um, changing it at the record you are at, but really more often that we're seeing this is when you're doing a record keeper change um, and you have this moment in time to really engage participants in it because you have to, because things are happening and things are moving. Um, and so I recently um, had a client do a vendor search in the summer. They elected a new record keeper as part of that search. And we, they decided after um, discussing and, and looking at their participant engagement to do a QDA mapping into a target date fund. Um, and they did that for a couple of reasons. One, there were um, some asset classes in the menu that we didn't want to maintain um, when we moved to the new record keeper. So we were doing a little bit of menu cleanup anyway. And the other piece was that their employee base had been fairly unengaged with the retirement plan for some time. And so, you know, there were folks who had started with the company 10 years ago and maybe selected an asset class, um, an asset allocation at that point and hadn't looked at it since. And so really felt like this was a good opportunity to get those folks um, re-engaged with the plan and allocated into what is probably a, a more appropriate um, asset allocation for their age and their goals. Um, but this is more paternalistic, you mentioned that. And so I think that when you're doing this kind of large scale change, um, it's an opportunity to engage participants, but you have to do a fair, you have to do more communication with them. And so, of course, with any kind of mapping you're going to do, um, the legally required notices. But I think with a QDA mapping, it may make sense to do, especially in a transition, do a broader, maybe a welcome letter, letting folks know um, that this change is coming because we are changing people's allocations. And so for the folks who are super engaged and have made these decisions themselves to allocate to other funds, we are changing that. And of course, they always have the opportunity to go in and undo that change, um, but it is making uh, impacting folks that are already engaged and maybe more vocal. So it's important to think about how you are communicating that. I think that takes us, those are our three most common, and we'll get into re-enrollment and it's a really sort of a special case later, but I think there are other pieces to this that we think are important to focus on it. And one is that the your record keeper is going to be a really important partner in any kind of change you do, because of course they're doing the administrative work of, of uh, literally moving the, uh, the assets and the allocations for participants, but they're also likely the ones that are going to draft and potentially deliver the communication, whether that's emails or letters or on the website. And they're also likely the group that is going to do the participant education, maybe participant advice. So the vendors are a really key partner in this. And you wanna make sure that they are able to do the kind of mapping technique that the committee is approving. Um, I think at this point, most of the vendors we are working for have the ability to do lots of, of different and interesting things here, but you wanna confirm that before you start uh, telling folks how their money is going to move. Um, and as I mentioned, especially when you're doing a QDI mapping, participants have the option to do um, to make changes, but for folks who want help in making those kinds of decisions, um, a group education, maybe a webinar makes sense, or even one-on-one -on -one individual counseling, whether that's just education about um, asset allocations or if your record keeper provides actual um, investment selection advice. So it's important to incorporate all of those when you're planning on um, especially a large menu change. Yeah, I think this is a real opportunity, one, to ensure that things are mapped correctly. Um, so there is that component of the review, but also it's an opportunity to, to review the, I guess, the style in which the communication is drafted. 
Um, we often have discussions with client committees around, hey, are, is this going to be, are my participants going to see this? What are they going to review? Are they going to see it if it's coming from the record keeper? Do we need to send this out? So I think there's an opportunity here that depending on the, the scale of the changes that your clients are going to be more, your participants are going to be more engaged uh, with the change and therefore potentially you may want to put some of the uh, wording in your voice from a corporate benefits or you know a plan sponsor benefits program. And uh, I think there's an opportunity there to, to garner some interest and enthusiasm uh, towards the uh, retirement program. Definitely. And I think especially if you are doing a change that may seem like a takeaway if you're moving an asset, removing an asset class that has been in the menu before, um, that may be more likely to spur some um, interaction for participants. And so having, you know, good advocates for the retirement plan in the um, employee base and, and really thinking carefully about the communications, I think, is really, really key. We've talked a little bit about the, you know, the reasons for uh, for mapping, some of the methods for mapping. Uh, we wanted to take the opportunity uh, in the remaining time to talk a little bit about a special case of, of, of QDI mapping that's a bit broader in nature, and this is uh, re-enrollment. Um, re-enrollment is really Two, two specific components uh, to it. It's one, a participation uh, component and two, a fund selection uh, component. We've talked a lot about the fund selection component already, which is you know, mapping assets from a current and uh, you know, current allocations into a target date fund or other uh, QDIA option for both the current assets and the future contributions. Um, but the other piece of this is really on the participation side. Um, from a participation side, it's really an opportunity to convert non-savers and move them into the plan and, and you know, essentially move them into the pool of the plan. And this is, uh, you, know, you really have three different types of participants uh, here or employees. You can have employees that aren't contributing to the plan and not participating in the plan. And those you're going to move into the plan at a set uh, rate. So there's a default rate, whether that's three, six, seven, ten uh, percent. That's a decision that you'll make as a committee on what you want to uh, default people into. The second group of people is you know people that are participating, but they're participating below the default rate. So you're going to raise them up to the default rate. If they're contributing one percent today, then you're going to move them up to the default rate. Uh, at, at that specified time. And then there's a third group of participants that are already in the plan, they're already contributing, but they're contributing at a rate above the default rate. Well, you're not gonna impact them from a, uh, from a contribution standpoint. If they're contributing seven and their default rate is three, then they're gonna stay at, uh, we're gonna keep them at seven because we don't wanna bring them down uh, to a, a, lower, a lower contribution rate. So really have three different types of participants um, there. The, you know, the stat there on the bottom, um, and this is something that I think we've talked a lot about with clients over the years, is the nudge or the default uh, feature. People are generally in favor of, of auto features. Participants, uh, workers like the, the idea of having decisions made for them. That's particularly true. Uh, statistics show with uh, younger participants, they've grown up with nudges uh, from a technology standpoint and are more comfortable with nudges. Uh, committees that discuss this all the time and are like, hey, if, if you as a committee have spent time thinking about what's the appropriate contribution rate um, and what's the appropriate asset allocation, and then yeah, I should contribute, but I don't want to make those decisions, you've given them a default solution, um, which I think is, is beneficial because ultimately, Many plans have moved towards auto enrollment, but that misses those long-term employees from you know pre-2007, 9, 10, before these auto enrollment programs uh, were added that don't benefit from that. So this is an opportunity to pick up those participants that uh, may have uh, accepted the nudge 
had the, the nudge been there when they, when they enrolled. Ellie, if you can move to the next slide. Um, so here, you know, from a benefit standpoint, I think of it both from a participant and a plan sponsor standpoint. Um, you know, this is likely going to improve positive outcomes. So we're going to get people to save. We're getting them to save more, and we're probably going to get them to be more diversified in their asset allocation as a result of a re-enrollment. Um, I think your Vanguard had a study a number of years ago that uh, pointed towards uh, about nine out of 10 participants that were auto-enrolled remained in the plan uh, a number of years, a uh, year, a year and a half later. Um, so the statistics there support people that get moved into plans tend to stay, tend to stay in plans. Um, from a company or plan sponsor, uh, fiduciary committee, uh, risk management standpoint, I think there's benefits that we talked about with regard to the risk management component of using the default investment, the QDIA investment that's diversified in their fiduciary relief associated with that fiduciary uh, decision. Um, the next bullet here on long-term employer cost reductions, um, this is truly long-term. Uh, Prudential did a study that suggested, you know, if the average retirement age increases by one year, that increases the workforce cost by one to one and a half percent, whether that be through you know, higher healthcare premiums uh, or just you know, uh, higher salaries for, for workers that have uh, more tenure uh, rather than you know, younger replacement workers. So I think there's a cost there, which is a tough balance uh, to say, yeah, there may be more uh, cost, but it's so far out there. Is that uh, how much of a concern is that in the current environment uh, from a plan sponsor budgeting standpoint? And then, you know, lastly here, it's really an opportunity to re-engage participants and non-participating employees. Um, you know, I think we all know that circumstances change uh, probably faster than we can make uh, individual decisions about our retirement plan. And really what this does is it gives uh, people, employees, if you do this on a regular basis, like every couple of years, um, it gives people really easy opportunities to save. Uh, and, and their circumstances may have changed from the time that they enrolled to now that they can afford to save, but they just haven't gone in and, and decided to, to participate. So this is an opportunity to make it easy for them to save save more and save uh, in a more diversified manner. And then the last thing there, you know, there always is the opt out. I think this is something that we get a lot of discussion with committees around, you know, it feels very paternalistic. We want participants to make their own decisions. And yes, we do uh, want them to make their own decisions, but we always have the ability, if the participant's not happy with it, they can say, no, I'm pulling the ripcord. I can't afford it now, I'm gonna step out. Uh, I'll, can, I'll come back to this decision uh, later. I think from a consideration standpoint, um, clearly this is a big change. Uh, it's a re-engagement with the program. Uh, it's a highlighting of a, of a benefit to participants. Um, I think it's a real opportunity to put your stamp from a company uh, employer uh, benefit messaging uh, and not just use standard uh, materials from your from your record keeper. Um, I think it's also an opportunity to do some education and have some, as Haley mentioned, some champions within your organization that can answer questions and really promote the value of, of the benefit. Um, clearly, moving people from non-participating to participating, if there is a, let's say, a match component or some component of employer cost that's related to participation, um, it's, you're, you're likely going to see, uh, see an increase in the short term. I think that's one that is, can be modeled, but also has to be balanced against you know, the long-term cost of people not being able to retire, I think is a pretty important counterbalance uh, to that. Haley, any, uh, any thoughts on, on re-enrollment? Yeah, you know, I, I had a client recently who was concerned about both their participation rate and outcomes for participants. They were worried that 
this plan had been in place for a long time, but that folks weren't going to have enough to retire well. And um, that was a big concern for them. And so we discussed it as a committee and in one meeting, they made two separate but important decisions. One, they decided to add automatic enrollment um, for new employees. And that's sort of a switch you can flip doesn't impact your current employee base because it's only for new folks and the, they don't know any different. They don't know that everyone else has not been auto enrolled. So it's you know a pretty low impact to add that right now. The second decision they made was to re-enroll their entire employee base, but they didn't wanna do those two pieces at the same time. Um, when they were considering their participation um, and they were considering sort of the, the total employee relationship, they decided to do the re-enrollment concurrent with when the annual raises were happening and when the other benefits were being discussed. So it could be a really um, combined and streamlined process because the goal was that everyone gets raises this year, that's great. Um, and let's get the new higher contribution rates in at the same time. So there's never a paycheck where you have your higher paycheck and then you, you have less because you're contributing more to your retirement plan. We wanted to try it and focus them at the same time. So you, know, you don't know what you're missing really because it's going into the retirement plan. The other thing that it allowed them to do was because they were talking about the other benefits available to employees and they were able to um, really champion this really great benefit that they were providing. Um, and it was a, a time to really um, show the employees um, the, the really great benefits. And, and um, ultimately uh, they did that, I think it was in March, they re-enrolled everyone and they've had really positive um, responses uh, and they've really seen an increase um, in uh, their participation rate and their deferral rates. And um, ultimately it's been a really positive experience for them and, and hopefully their employees long-term. Oh, that's great. I, I think um, I'm reminded of a conversation I seem to come across quite often with committees is a lot of concern for employees' ability to retire. And it's largely focused on participants that are near retirement. And I think what we all know conceptually is if we don't get, you know, time is on people's side. And if we don't get them to start saving appropriately and early, um, no amount of work at the end is going to, a bit, is, is going to make it uh, uh, more likely they have a positive outcome in retirement. So this is really a long-term solution where we can, through these nudges, uh, re-enrollment and uh, being one of those, I think give a, a, a increase the likelihood of, of positive of positive outcomes. Maybe as we move to the the last slide, uh, I'm not seeing any questions, uh, so I think this might be a, a short wrap up. But we just want to first off thank you for joining uh, the webinar today, um, and just reiterate that there really is no single solution for for fund mapping. All three options are viable. Uh, and I, you know, I've had clients this last year that used all three options in a single, uh, a single conversion, a single record keeper conversion, and it just made sense for, you know, option one for this set of funds, option two for these set of funds, and option three for this third set of funds. So I think they can be used in, in combination through consultation with your committee and, and your advisor. Ultimately, I think, you know, thoughtful review of circumstances, uh, participant needs, the committee preferences uh, will help you ultimately determine the, 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 the right strategy for you. Um, we're going to uh, end the webinar and let you know that we will be sending out the, a link to this webinar uh, later, uh, as, along with a copy of our uh, fund mapping fiduciary training piece that's part of our larger uh, fiduciary training program for, for committees. Um, and I'm not seeing any questions. Uh, we'll hold for a, a second or two, but uh, otherwise we'll thank you for, for joining and, uh, and uh, appreciate your time today. Yeah, thank you everyone. We're really glad you took the time out of your day to think about this. And it's, um, it's an important decision whenever you're making a change. Um, and I think that, uh, careful deliberation and, and thoughtful um, interactions are important as you're working through any, any change with your retirement plan.
Thanks, Haley. Oh, right. we do have, look at that. <laughs> I gotta thank you. All right, I'll take that as a, com as a comment. Perfect. Appreciate it. Enjoy the rest of your day. Yep, have a great day.